All right, just give me one moment here and then I'm gonna begin uh, with uh, my initial comments. Okay, and next thing up, we'll be sharing the screen. Can everybody see the, uh, see the screen? Look good? All right, so to start with, I'm just gonna give a sort of a little broader context of when we're talking about running elections in and as the Democratic Socialists of America, uh, what is it we're doing? How do we approach electoral politics? Because it may be different from a lot of what people have experienced or know from other organizations. I mean, there's a lot of the organizations you encounter in electoral politics are purely electoral in that they exist to run candidates, support candidates for office, um, and that's that's their thing. You know, there's some of them are political action committees like Justice Democrats. Some of them are 501c4 nonprofits like Our Revolution. Some of them are political parties with ballot lines like the Democrats and the Working Families Party. Well, in the case of the Democrats, I think it's actually not that useful to even call them a party, but that's a conversation for another time. Um, so how does DSA fit into this? DSA is legally a 501c4, meaning it's a nonprofit that can engage in certain kinds of electoral activities. We also have a political action committee, the DSA PAC, as well as a 501c3 arm that can do educational work called the DSA Fund. But beyond all of those sort of legal technicalities, the important thing is that DSA is also a democratic member-led mass organization. And it's an organization that doesn't just exist to elect progressives, it exists to fight for socialism. And so to understand any the role of a DSA election campaign, you have to see how electoral work fits into that project. And so I, to start with, we can talk about more broadly how people on the left, radicals, revolutionaries, anti-capitalists, have seen electoral politics. There's different approaches that you commonly see. There are some people you might call the non-electoral or even anti-electoral left who see elections in a capitalist society as sort of fundamentally rigged toward the bourgeoisie and a kind of waste of time and a distraction from other things. So they may prioritize, you know, building unions, organize, you know, organizing the workplace or, you know, tenant unions or mutual aid networks or doing education or building a revolutionary party to seize power but not doing electoral work. Another type of electoral work is what I would call the sort of symbolic type of work where you're running elections, but you're not really expecting to win or even come close. You're just trying to use the sort of stage that the election gives you to draw attention to your ideas and your proposals, right? So when the Green Party say, or certain small socialist organizations run candidates that they know are gonna get like 1% of the vote, the point is not to win, the point is to get the message out and use elections as a vehicle for doing that. And finally, there's what you might call the reformist perspective where getting as many progressive candidates in office as you can and getting whatever incremental reforms you can is the whole thing. It's the whole goal, right? So reform is not in the sense that just that you fight for reforms because all of us fight for reforms basically in DSA, but that that's your only focus. And I want to suggest that DSA in a way, it's modern electoral strategy encompasses a kind of a combination of all three of these things uh, or an attempt to synthesize them. There's a recognition that elections are not enough. And that in fact, we need to be base building in deeper and more durable ways between elections. We need to be in communities in ways that aren't just asking for people's votes uh, if we wanna really build power. Uh, we also recognize that running candidates can be a good way to promote ideas even when you lose, whether it's Medicare for all or the Green New Deal. Um, but finally, we do run to win, not only to win, but to win. So what is DSA? DSA has a national official electoral strategy that was adopted at our 2021 uh, convention last August that you can find online at electoral.dsausa.org. And this basic top line summary is DSA engages in electoral organizing because elections are one of the primary avenues through which working people experience politics. That's where people are. That's where people are going to hear you and see your message. But DSA uses electoral campaigns to build a durable political organization and grow the collective strength needed for our membership and elected officials to effectively wield political power. So it's not just about winning, it's about effectively building our organization and building the power to win for the working class. How does this fit together in terms of DSA as an organization? So you know, we are a pretty much bottom up decentralized organization. Electoral strategy really comes up from local chapters like ours here in Mid-Hudson Valley DSA. It's the local chapters that have the, the ability to recruit and endorse the candidates. They know the conditions on the ground. We know what rate, where we wanna invest 
in a race, we know who are the candidates to support oftentimes because they are our own members. Uh, and we run the volunteer driven field programs in order to build capacity that is intended not just to win, but to build beyond that election cycle uh, and build durable power. Then at the level of national DSA, we have our national electoral committee that has representatives from all over the country, which will look at candidates that are being endorsed at a local level. And not every local candidate gets a national endorsement that sometimes they don't even want it. It's, you know, again, it's very decentralized, but the national endorsement that can provide additional resources that come from national DSA. The national electoral committee can also provide guiding and training to chapters and they coordinate the DSA and office network, which is, you know, the idea of keeping connections and building connections between elected socialists in office across the country, across different chapters of DSA. And finally, national DSA, meaning our paid staff, as well as our elected leadership, the National Political Committee, uh, can do things like build national fundraising programs and can you know, engage with the media to promote the campaigns we have going on, to celebrate victories when we have them. Uh, that's sort of how it fits together in like a logistical way. But then, so how then do we, these decisions at both a local and a national level get made about who to endorse and who to invest in, in terms of candidates? DSA has what I would call a focused approach to endorsements that also contrasts with a lot of other groups. You see a lot of organizations that are primarily about fundraising or media and will have a lot of what I would call paper endorsements, meaning you say, I like you and you can use our brand if it's helpful to you, but you know we're not like it giving actually a, putting a lot into your campaign. So if you look at the Working Families Party in New York, for example, they've endorsed dozens of people this cycle, including Serhana, for assembly and state senate and other races. And realistically, they're, you know, that's mostly paper endorsements. They're not able to put huge numbers of resources into most of those races. Not to say that's a terrible thing, that's just a different approach, and it's not DSA's approach. DSA's approach typically today is to limit endorsements to the races where we can really provide some serious resources to back up that campaign, um, whether it's one of our own members or somebody just that we closely support. And because we don't have billionaire backers, what serious resources from DSA means is people power. It means the energy and the time of the organizers and the volunteers who are phone banking and knocking on doors, dry, you know, driving things around, make graphic designing all of it. And this has been a very successful approach for DSA in the last few years. Uh, I will say, uh, I this isn't a fairly new thing for DSA as an organization. I've I've been in DSA since the 90s, so I actually remember what it was like before. Uh, and DSA used to be more like these other organizations that just sort of hand out paper endorsements. This is uh, from a little before my time, but it floats around on the internet. And the punchline of it is that Nancy Pelosi is on it. But the bigger point here is that this was DSA's 1996 endorsements, which, you know, aside from the fact that some of these people have crappy politics, you know, this is just a list of names on the list. DSA in 1996 was not pounding the pavement to get these people elected to office. So the post 2016 era of DSA has been a different thing, a much more focused, a much more intense way of approaching electoral politics. So going back to the national electoral strategy document, what are the components of a DSA campaign as laid out in our national strategy? There are five components that they put out there. One, we run class struggle campaigns. What does that mean? Develop a message and platform that speaks to working people's needs and aspirations and forces political actors to answer the question, which side are you on? In other words, not only are we speaking directly to people's needs, but we are forcing the campaign and the messaging and all of the debate to go in a direction that makes clear the divide between where we stand as socialists and not only the right, but also the corporate Democrats that also stand in our way. And that's how we build something that goes beyond a single campaign that actually is putting forward a larger vision and a larger project of building power. Two, we run organizers. So we, what we want to avoid most of the time is individuals who may be nice and have good ideas, but are sort of individuals isolated, maybe without that much of a mass base. We need elected officials to be organizers for the socialist movement and ideally to be DSA cadre and our own leaders. Three, identifying strategic races. So we want clear opportunities to win power and not just to make a statement. So what does it mean to be strategic in this sense? I mean, it probably doesn't mean running in the most Republican district in your area where you're going to get destroyed. It probably also doesn't mean trying to primary the most progressive person in your region that isn't quite left enough for you. But it might look like trying to knock off a 20 year Deadwood incumbent uh, who is in a progressive district uh, and is not moving on the things that matter to the people of that district. We, for organizing coalition. Um, and so DSA is not the whole of the left. We're too small and we also do not look like the broad working class. We're not representative 
totally of the whole working class. We, we win by working coalition. That doesn't mean we give up our principles. What it does mean is that we find those areas of common ground and common interests where labor unions and community organizations come into alignment with DSA through the work of a campaign. And finally, again, we run to win. If you run a campaign that's doomed from the start, that doesn't build power, and it's also not a good way to recruit or build DSA. Final point I make about sort of the strategy piece that sometimes come up in and outside the DSA, is DSA a party? Does it want to be a party? It says in our documents, in fact, our ultimate goal is to build a working class political party. Um, now that's sort of ambiguous as to what that would mean. I think a lot of people think it would have to mean something other than the Democrats, who are certainly not a working class political party today. But you may have noticed that DSA candidates, including our mid Hudson Valley DSA candidates tend to run on democratic ballot lines and in democratic primaries. So what is that about? Well, let's talk about what in terms of our electoral strategy, a party means because it's actually sort of ambiguous. What is a party? According to our strategic document, a party recruits and run, can, runs candidates. It trains campaign organizers, provides access to money and donor networks. It develops policies that can be introduced and implemented once people are in office and it organizes its members and other voters to support the candidates and pressure to pass the policies. Now, of course, DSA already can and does do all of these things, which leads to the concept that's sometimes called the party surrogate, which even says even while DSA continues to run most of its races on the Democratic ballot line, our chapters can master all of these functions that I just laid out without the support of capitalists or the Democratic Party establishment and use them to advance fully independent working class politics. So that, again, is part of the objective of what we were trying to build here. So let's bring it down to concrete something concrete before we move in to some uh, listening to some other people what does this look like in the campaign that this chapter is currently all in on sarah hana for assembly 2022 is this a class struggle campaign well sarah hana is running on issues like public power and renewable energy which draw a clear political dividing line with the incumbent opponent you can be for the beautiful future of public utilities and clean energy or the dirty present of fossil fuel money and not getting anything done with a democratic majority in albany we are running organizers sarah hana is a leader of this chapter she's been heavily involved with our eco-socialist working group the public power campaign doing lots of our graphic design and that so from the very beginning this has been a campaign that came was by of and for you know mid hudson valley dsa and the hudson valley left uh, identifying strategic races. This is a race that builds on the success of a race that we were involved in last year, where our chapter member was, I believe, on this call currently, Phil Erner, was elected to the Ulster County Legislature from a district that's inside the district that Sarah Hanna is currently running in. So that sort of set the groundwork and showed that this was the next logical step. And in that campaign, as in Sarah Hanna's campaign, this chapter of DSA has provided a lot of time from volunteer organizers to make those campaigns happen and make those wins happen. And we're organizing a coalition. Sarah Hanna is getting support from local groups like For the Many that we've also worked with on other issues, from statewide groups like the Working Family Party. And finally, of course, we are running to win and we're going to win. And to get into some more of how that's playing out on the ground, we're going to go to first um, a couple of the field directors for the campaign who are also chapter members, Michelangelo Pomerico and then Jen Benson. And then after that, we're going to hear from Sarah Hanna herself. Uh, to give her sort of context for what this campaign means uh, for Mid Hudson Valley DSA, for the Hudson Valley, and for the project of socialism. So let's, um, I will stop share for right here. One moment. Um, so, yeah, so we're going to take it to Milo, Michelangelo, first. Um, again, my, Milo, field lead, in addition to a major leader of this chapter over the last few years. Uh, has been out there, you know, organizing the volunteers, pounding the pavement, everything else. I wanted, was hoping you could start a little bit, Milo, just telling us a little bit, uh, you know, of your sort of origin story in terms of coming into DSA and then, you know, getting, being on the ground floor of launching this campaign, where that come, came from, why you decided this was the time to do this, and a little bit about like where, where you're going with it and what you are trying to accomplish with this campaign. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as Peter mentioned, my name is Milo or Michelangelo. Um, I go by the pronouns he, him. I joined DSA in mid-late 2019. And like many people who joined DSA after the Bernie wave of 2016, I was attracted to the organization through an electoral campaign, right? Through Bernie Sanders' run for president in uh, 2020. Um, and at the time, I actually joined a bunch of different organizations. I joined Sunrise. I joined the Bernie campaign formally to try to volunteer. 
Um, but almost immediately, I had a really phenomenal contact with DSA members, including Peter, um, our treasurer, and a good friend of mine, Nicholas Moran, um, and Matt Carroll, who's also on this call, who's a big contributor to our electoral work in the chapter and is also a member of our steering committee. Um, and you know, I, I think in addition to the electoral work that was happening in the country uh, through Bernie's race, uh, one of the other things that, of course, drew me in was really the kind of existential crisis that we face under capitalism and uh, under the current climate crisis. Uh, at the time, I had been very heavily following the events in Brazil around the uh, imprisonment of Lula da Silva uh, and the like eco ecological disaster happening in the Amazon still occurring today and really feeling a sense of cynicism about the future and not knowing where I would be in my own life in 20 years, let alone where the planet would be and wanting to try to do something. Um, I was also very much looking for community and camaraderie and looking for a family uh, outside of my, my, you know, my, my own home family. And uh, I definitely found that through DSA and through organizing with just incredible people uh, over the last couple of years on really powerful campaigns that have opened my eyes to what really is achievable through solidarity and through collective uh, struggle. And so, um, yeah, I think, you know, Peter laid out a lot of the things that um, led to our decision to run. But I think, you know, in addition to some of the work, and I'm going to share my screen to just kind of go through some fun stuff here. So in addition to uh, what Peter laid out with, uh, with Phil Erner's run in 2021, um, you know, in addition to that, we ran actually a total of six candidates for local office last year through our electoral working group and five out of those six candidates won their local races. And that very much set up the kind of electoral backbone of our chapter, so to speak. We had not really run a lot of local campaigns prior to that. And so it was really a first time for us to flex a lot of muscles in ways that we hadn't before, uh, built new leaders in the chapter, and it gave us a sense of what it took to really run a ground game for a campaign in a very serious way. Uh, and so, of course, in 2021, Phil Erner's campaign really did set the stage in Ulster County, as Peter mentioned. Got some fun pictures here. It was a small crew. Actually, these aren't even the biggest canvases. We did have more people out um, in Kingston knocking doors. But, um, you know, this just goes to show that we had very small beginnings. This was a very uh, small campaign with a handful of very dedicated volunteers running very dedicated field work, knocking a tremendous number of doors in Kingston. And it was a blowout election. It wasn't even close. Phil won by a massive margin and uh, defeated a 27 year incumbent who was the chair of the Ulster County Legislature. And so this really did kind of set our chapter up as a serious uh, grassroots electoral force in the area. And so in addition to Phil's run, um, one of the other things that our chapter and Sarah Hanna and myself and others were very uh, adamantly working on throughout 2021 was our statewide and local public power campaign. And so, you know, there has been serious inaction in Albany. We are now three years running with no major climate legislation passed at the state level. And our chapter is a partner. As Peter mentioned before, we do a lot of coalition work and coalition work is very crucial to the act of being able to pursue electoral politics in a serious way. And so we are a partner of public power New York, which is a statewide coalition of over 20 organizations fighting to take over the energy system in New York State from generation to transmission and distribution infrastructure and make the entire system publicly owned and democratically controlled. And so uh, last year, we introduced the Build Public Renewables Act, which is a bill to allow the New York Power Authority, the largest publicly owned utility in the country, to build, own, and operate new utility-scale renewable energy, addressing the incredible shortcomings of the market-driven system we are overly reliant on in New York, which has been extremely slow to cite renewable energy, uh, leading the state right now to be reliant on only 6%, uh, potentially even less than that, of wind and solar combined in our total generation mix, which is one fifth of the energy generated in Texas from renewable uh, energy sources. And so um, this was a critical bill that would, you know, democratize and create more public uh, renewable energy in New York state. And it did not pass last year. Um, and uh, this is a photo of one of the actions that we organized in Albany at the uh, height of the, uh, of the last legislative session. Um, at this action, and I'll be speaking in detail a little bit about what this looks like in, in the terms of the power dynamics, but we also had uh, Assembly Member uh, Zoran Mamdani and uh, State Senator Jabari Brisport speaking to of the DSA's uh, current DSA slate members 
um, who are both public power advocates and uh, huge champions of the Build Public Renewables Act. And so this was, uh, you know, leading into some of the other conditions that led to our decision to run uh, Sarah Hanna for our for this uh, state assembly seat, uh, the one of third. Um, was our work at the state level fighting this public power campaign and realizing in interactions with legislators, including our opponent, Kevin Cahill, that there was a just a severe lack of imagination of what was possible and blatant corruption, right? These are legislators, elected representatives, leaders who are taking thousands of dollars from fossil fuel interests, and it is quite literally influencing and making in, leading to decisions on policy. And so, you know, we felt an urgent need because of the district, uh, which is a very progressive district, that we needed to make a decision to run for this seat because it was a strategic choice that would better position the left in New York State and especially the socialist left to be able to continue to build the power we need to pass things like public power legislation, like the Build Public Renewables Act, things like the New York Health Act, uh, and things like a uh, a good cause eviction at the state level. And I, I could go on and on. There are tremendous numbers of legislative priorities, including things like tax the rich, that are you know being hampered by a lack of, of real power that the left can wield in the state. Um, and so, you know, we are on the verge, this chapter, Mid-Hudson Valley DSA is on the verge of making history by electing uh, Sarah Hanna, who would be the first socialist outside of New York City to be elected to the legislature. And we are quite literally building a mass movement one door at a time uh, here in, uh, in the Hudson Valley in this race. And uh, we got some phenomenal pictures of our amazing campaign team here. Um, and really just the contrast of running local campaigns with a small crew and just seeing the team just grow and grow and grow. Uh, this is the largest event we've had over the last few months. This was a huge petition kickoff on Sarah Hada's birthday in the city of Kingston, uh, where we had, I believe, 56 people uh, turn out for a day of canvassing. Um, and so it has been a really empowering campaign. Um, and it has also provided us really incredible means to talk to voters about the issues. Um, I cannot say enough about how public power has become a not only a winning issue, but an issue of priority on almost every single door that we uh, contact voters at. Um, this year alone, we saw massive outages because of various uh, really extreme weather events and winter storms across the, uh, across the region, uh, leaving some people without power for days. And we have also experienced really dramatic rate increases under Central Hudson, uh, our investor-owned utility monopoly here, uh, in part because of rising cost of gas, um, but also because they have an underlying perverse incentive to increase the costs for rate payers and to shift the burden of costs away from their shareholders uh, in the form of the return on equity uh, that they have they're accountable to have to basically provide. So there's always a profit motive underlying all of these utilities in New York State. And Central Hudson is making decisions that says they are going to prioritize shareholder profits, the benefit of a wealthy few over the many, over you know working class people in this district, in the Central Hudson service area, who have seen their bills go from anywhere between you know, 500, 600 to as high as $1,500 for a monthly bill. Um, and it's, it's just criminal what they're getting away with. And so, you know, as much as there are calls now from legislators in this region to have hearings on a Central Hudson to try to understand what exactly went down with their billing practices, um, that is just inherently insufficient because we understand as socialists that the issue is not a billing issue or a sudden rate increase because of any underlying thing, but it is fundamentally the for-profit system that we have uh, that makes energy a commodity and says that people do not should not uh, have access to these things at a fair cost or at no cost because there has to be profit. Um, and it is also incompatible with the climate crisis and understanding that until we prioritize a just transition to renewable energy on the timeline that we have to adhere to to be able to survive the worst impacts of the climate crisis, uh, that we will, you know, we, we cannot do that under a for-profit system. And the in, uh, investor-owned utilities are just not equipped to be able to do that job. And that is why we are fighting for public power. And so um, all of these things, 
really led to attention uh, in our experience here in the Hudson Valley uh, that really led to the decision to run. Uh, one of our members who, as Peter mentioned, is a core member of our, of our chapter, Sarah Hanna is cadre. She is, has been a chapter leader since joining, um, has followers in the organization. These are all really important underlying things that are required when deciding to run for a state assembly race. I think the stakes are a lot lower when running local races that allows for some ideological flexibility and flexibility in the strategy but when you commit to running an assembly race, we are talking about, you know, tens of thousands of voters that need to be spoken to. Words that we've already raised over a hundred thousand uh, dollars in, in in grassroots small dollar contributions. Like these are this is the level that we have to operate at in order to be competitive, in order to have a chance of winning. And we we do not only just have a chance of winning, but I think we have all. Of, like the best shot in the world because we have such an incredible team and such an incredible campaign built of volunteers and members of DSA that are inspired and really motivated by what's at stake. Um, and the last thing that I will note is that it's not just the local conditions or a legislative campaign that led to our decision to run, but it is also the broader statewide electoral strategy that we are trying to participate in and develop. And so, you know, the current slate of six assembly members and uh, state senators that are mostly based out of New York City, um, you know, there's a, been a long project through New York City DSA, um, basically building this slate and developing the Socialist and Office Committee there, which is a model I think our chapter is going to look at trying to develop heading into next year to both hold electeds accountable, but also to be able to build a cohesive strategy around how we work with our elected officials. And one of the realities that we are facing in legislative campaigns across the state is that there is no upstate DSA power in the legislature. And so the importance, not just from a symbolic standpoint, but from a strategic standpoint of electing Sarah Hanna here and being victorious is really about setting a condition and a model that other chapters can replicate and contribute to that will allow more socialists to win across the state of New York in the years to come. Um, and that is literally what's at stake because if we do not build a cohesive you know, minority or a leverageable uh, group of legislators in the in the assembly and the Senate, we do not have the leverage to be able to really push leadership to get our bills passed and to be able to build the power that's needed to enact real change that will improve the lives of working class people. Um, and so that is kind of my whole pitch um, in terms of you know why we ran and the importance of this race. Really can't understate it enough. We have the ability to make history here in the Hudson Valley. Uh, this would be literally history in the making. Um, and I think a lot of other chapters stand to learn so much from our experience uh, in this race. And that is, I think, one of the things as a member of DSA, I'm very excited about is when this race is over, uh, taking what we have learned and bringing that to other chapters so that they too can do what we're doing here uh, so we can continue to build a DSA slate that encompasses the entire state of New York uh, so we can actually make New York a symbol of possibility for the rest of the country. Um, and for the national organization, of course. Um, and so I guess I'll pass it back to our uh, to our hosts. Yeah, thanks. Well, that was a, a great little, uh, sort of a com pretty comprehensive rundown. I mean, before we, uh, before I go to Jen, I mean, just a couple of things that stand out for me is, I mean, one is that sort of you, you know, people come into this work in DSA from very different directions. You know, you were engaged in sort of the policy and issue work, specifically the public power stuff. And I think, you know, it seems like, that really shows that recognition that a lot of times, you know, you a lot of demands come down to you want the state to do something. Uh, so and to sort of to paraphrase Trotsky, you may not be concerned about electoral politics, but electoral politics is concerned about you because ultimately you're left either you're just sort of demanding things and trying to find a way to force people to do what you want or you get your own people to be able to do them your, themselves. Um, and that seems to me is like, that's a, a leap that sometimes has to get made is that like, if we want this done, the people who are currently in office are not going to do it. We just have to, we have to replace them. Um, and that speaks also to the fact that, you know, we're in New York where Democrats hold a supermajority, control the state government, just as currently for a little while longer nationally, Democrats control the legislature. And we're told again and again, well, you know, they, they believe in all the nice things we believe in and they want to do nice things. They just can't for some reason or another. And the premise of a campaign like this is sort of that that's not true, that it makes a difference whether the, whether it's the current person or Sarah Hanna who is in that seat. Uh, not obviously that Sarah Hanna in and of herself is going to transform New York politics, but that that's the, the shift we have to make and that that does matter. Uh, and I think that that's, 
that's a that's I think is in, in itself a sort of there's a political value in getting people and showing people that and proving to people that it's true. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, there's one other thing that I, I want to emphasize because again you mentioned that I a lot of what I got invested in when I joined the organization was the policy side of things and connecting that to an electoral strategy. Um, I want to make it very clear that like good policy doesn't just come out of thin air. And a lot of these bills that we are fighting for, including the tax, the rich legislation and the public power legislation, quite literally were written by comrades, were written by other members of DSA in, in coalition and in, 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 in a team setting. So, you know, th the opportunity that we have through our electoral strategy and building power through electoral work is also about having the opportunity to introduce the literal policy solutions like within the state, within the power structures we have to enact real material change for people. Um, and that is, has been a very empowering experience as well in seeing really, I think, a level of complexity and the barriers that I think a lot of people perceive policy wonkery to be about, um, that there is a level of accessibility of, of being able to write legislation. I, I have I did not go to college. I'm not a super educated person, but I was still able to sit down with, with other people that are just obsessed with public power. And we did a lot of amazing research. We spoke to incredible experts, people from all over the world. We spoke to uh, someone from, from Paris who was uh, in charge of a water observatory, a public water utility in Paris, uh, Anne Lestrat, I believe. We spoke with, uh, you know, professors at the in the state schools here in uh, in the city schools, uh, SUNY and CUNY uh, officials to talk about, uh, you know, uh, ideas around how we may be able to govern a public utility. So there, the the level of exposure that you have in DSA as a member, if you choose to engage in this work, is incredibly enlightening and empowering because you realize that a lot of how legislation is created is really this. The, the mystification of it is really just that there is there are moneyed interests introducing policies to their own behest. And when you cut that out and you have the power to be able to organize real policy through teamwork and through coalition and through building this kind of, you know, this coalition work of, uh, of, of people who have shared ideas and shared consensus about solutions, it is, it is a very powerful thing to be a part of. And so, you know, I, I just want to frame that, that this is, there, there are the layers that I discussed about the person you're electing, the electoral strategy, the movement building, but then there's also the solutions that underpin good legislation and what we expect our elected officials to carry out. Um, that also has to come from the organization and has to come from the work we do with other chapters across the state and across the country. Um, so yeah, it's a very important piece of it. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to something about, you know, the idea of DSA acting like a party surrogate, that one of the things the party does is that, is that developing the legislation, developing the policy, and that, you know, the mainstream corporate Democrats have lobbyists to do that for them. We have socialists doing it for us and that that is an important part of what's here. Um, so thanks, Milo. I'm going to we're going to turn now to Jen Benson, also field coordinator for Sarah Hanna. Um, and I'm going to sort of want to start off sort of the sort of same as I did for Milo to just tell us a little bit about I know you have backgrounds in other kinds of activism and organizing. So maybe a little bit about what your political background is and then how you found yourself joining DSA and then taking on this leading role in Sarah Hanna's campaign. Thank you, Peter. Um, well, Milo <laughs> and Nicholas Moran actually recruited me to volunteer on Phil's campaign. Um, I moved to the Hudson Valley in 2019, or I moved to Kingston in 2019. I've been in the Hudson Valley since 2015. Um, and in my professional life, I work at a nonprofit that does environmental organizing and environmental conservation. And in my, in my free time, I've tried to give as much time to progressive organizing as I can, particularly over the last eight or 10 years. Spent some time knocking doors for Bernie, making calls into New Hampshire, and really felt excited in a way that I hadn't about previous candidates. And so when I got the call um, to volunteer with Phil's campaign, I felt that same excitement and was a little bit nervous, to be totally honest, to knock doors during COVID. I didn't really know how people were going to react. Um, and I can't remember who exactly phone banked me, but I was like, dude, do people want to talk to strangers at their house right now? And what I heard was, yes, they do. People, have, people are actually feeling really isolated. And being able to come to their door and say, like, what are you worried about right now? 
is making a really big difference. Um, and so I, I hopped in in late summer and sort of knocked doors through the end of, of Phil's campaign. And then uh, they asked me to come on and help with Field in Kingston. And I'm currently working full time and going to grad school. And so I was worried that I wouldn't have enough to give, but it turns out that you can help with this campaign in whatever capacity you have. Um, we have really all types of people with all types of skill sets. Field is just a small portion of it. Um, we had some really beautiful letter writing at the beginning and postcards. Um, we have people that organize events and write really funny emails um, <laughs> that raise funds and recruit volunteers. And so um, it was really welcoming. I had a similar experience to Milo where I was really looking to build also my social network and to get to know people with similar values. Um, and my grad program was, was super small. And I was also finding that the policies that we were learning about weren't aligned with my values. I said Green New Deal and the professor rolled her eyes at me. Um, and so I knew that that was not going to be my ideological home. And so that was how I joined DSA. And what I've been really finding at the doors is people want to talk about the issues that are affecting their lives. And so from Phil's race and into Sarah Hanna's race, people are pretty surprised that someone is knocking on their doors really outside of Phil's district um, and really outside of Kingston, but they're, but they're intrigued. They want to know what we're talking about. They're curious why we care about uh, the issues that they're working on. And my house lost power for about 36 hours during the winter storms. Um, and so I was a little nervous for us to go knock. To, again, I'm nervous about canvassing, but I love canvassing and I'm field coordinating. So I don't know what that says about me. Um, but everyone was like, no, we should go check, check on people and see how they're doing and hear where they're at and see what they're afraid of and see what they're angry about. Um, and so we went out knocking doors like basically three hours after I got my power back. <laughs> Um, and we, I was great to hear my, the fears and the anger of my neighbors and be able to use that as an opportunity to talk about alternatives and to talk about public power. People hadn't, didn't think that that was an option. Um, corporate capture of most sides of our life is, is the norm and people aren't used to thinking outside of the box and also aren't used to being heard. Um, and in some cases, we had long conversations. Uh, Phil, I know Phil was out at doors within that weekend. I know Milo and Sarah Hanna, like we had lots of people out at doors. And the stories that we were hearing were really scary and really compelling. And really what they did was solidify the importance of this electoral campaign um, and the importance of, of getting someone, specifically Sarah Hanna, into office representing this district that actually wants to carry the voices of the people to Albany um, in a real way. And to be able to talk about things like Medicare for all and the lack of affordable housing in the Hudson Valley. I spoke with a woman tonight who, um, during the pandemic, she had been living in a house for 17 years. She's a musician, lives in Woodstock. And she got two weeks notice that the house had been sold. The, the house was sold sight unseen and she was given two weeks notice um, and had to move out and find somewhere new to live. And she hadn't been working during the pandemic and had been struggling to get, um, to get access to unemployment. And those are the types of stories that um, really motivate me and I think really drive the campaign forward. Um, and we just, we welcome everyone to get involved. Like it is really powerful to talk to your neighbors um, and your neighbors really want to talk to you. <laughs> the pandemic has been incredibly isolating. Like people are, people are happy to share what they are saying might be difficult, um, but they really want to be heard. And this campaign really wants to listen so we can carry the best policies and push the best policies forward in Albany that, that this district, but also the state of New York and also largely upstate New York desperately need to make the lives better of the working people. Awesome, thank you. I So, I mean, the first, you know, the one thing I just wanna highlight, you know, from what you said is that's important, you know, you're talking about the fact that you're, you've taken on this role with the campaign, though you're, you know, you're working day job, you're in school, you know, that, that fact is that, you know, whatever people might think, you know, people not, you know, not most people on this campaign are not getting paid for it. Right. This is people who are finding the time, putting in this, you know, 
this immense amount of effort. And like, you know, I think that's one of the remarkable things about DSA's electoral work. You know, I know one of the things that happened actually sort of right after like AOC got elected and then we had this first burst of kind of energy around DSA elections is that people noticed how many people, how much people power we could put in the streets. And it created almost this idea among certain politicians that like, if you could just get a DSA endorsement, then that was just like gonna be the unlock the door to just like as many phone bankers and canvassers as you could ask for. But, you know, it's a little, it's a little more complicated than that. So Jen is someone who I, you know, I've, I've been out on these, you know, I was out at the remarkable Kingston kickoff in the freezing cold where we had like 50 people out there. So to maybe talk a little bit about what goes into making that happen, what goes on into creating, you know, dozens of people to come out on a freezing cold day to go knock doors and talk to strangers. Yeah, we can do, we can demystify it a little bit. We have all, so many awesome pictures, um, but there is a lot of time and organizing that goes into planning an event. We have a really awesome sort of behind the scenes team that help us figure out like, what food should we have? What are the materials they're going to have on the clipboards? We have a couple of really amazing uh, volunteers in the campaign who drive lit down from the union shop in Albany. Um, we actually got a new lit drop off uh, tonight in a parking lot in Woodstock before we knocked doors. Um, and so there are people doing every, every type of action. We also do a lot of phone banking. Um, we text through a lot of you on this call have probably gotten texts probably from someone on the screen, actually. Um, hopefully you're putting a face to my name potentially now. So next time I text you, you'll like maybe come out and knock doors with me. Um, yeah. And so there's phone banking, there's calling, um, there's logistics. We also just have some people who are just bomb at events and bomb at logistics. We also have beautiful and brilliant graphic designers we have some really great posters. Milo is actually modeling the posters um, that we gift to our, our, our many volunteers. Um, and the other great thing about these events is we knock a lot of doors, but we also have a lot of fun. And we pair up people who haven't canvassed before um, or might be a little bit more nervous about um, trying to figure out what door is apartment to be upstairs, center right, whatever crazy directions you're trying to figure out where these doors are. And so we can really meet volunteers where they're at. And so we have activities that really anybody um, can do if you're interested and canvassing and field are just, are just one of them. It happens to be like my favorite part of talking to strangers and knocking on doors. Um, but if that's not your vibe, like also, someone needs to pick up the donuts and the coffee, and that's equally as important. And someone needs to do the data analysis, and that's equally as important. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. We Milo. also do phone bank bingo sometimes. I made the bingo board at the beginning of the campaign, and it has like some really funny, chaotic, uh, different bingo options. So we work really hard, but we also have a lot of fun. Um, like we threw Sarah Hanna a birthday party that involved two cakes and two rousing rounds of the birthday song. So, um, so know that it's not, it's not all work. We, we have both of it. And it's really that like joy, the, it's a joyful campaign. Like it is hard and it was very cold in Woodstock, which is why I'm still wearing my coat. But the reality is, is like this campaign is focused on creating a beautiful future. And what that involves is a joyful present and being able to celebrate the better future that we're working for as we're working for it has been really rewarding and really uplifting part of, of doing this work and being on this team. Awesome, thank you. And so I, so one last thing maybe to, that I was hoping you could reflect on because um, speaking to, well, the, the beautiful near future, which is, you know, one of the themes of this kind of, this discussion is that for socialists, for a group like DSA, elections are about more than the immediate task of winning the election. Now we're going to win the election, and we have a lot of work to do to do that. But you know, you've been talking about how some of these conversations on on the doors—they're not all just immediate. You know, well, I get your vote. Can you sign this petition? You know, you're having substantial conversations, and obviously, you're doing all that work of identifying people and keeping track. So, do you have any thoughts about sort of where this can go? you know, after the election is over, you know, in terms of building on some of the connections and some of the conversations that you've been, that we've been having, you know, over the course of this campaign. 
I think that one of the most beautiful things that I've, that I've seen in this campaign, um, but also Phil's campaign and, um, and like even Bernie organizing is that people make friends at doors. People make friends at canvas shifts. Like you end up meeting your community and with so much particularly isolation coming out of COVID, I really think that's such an important part of, of organizing um, even more broadly than electoral work is really building relationships and, and making the people in your community feel heard and then being able to help them feel and understand that like we care about the issues that are affecting them. And a lot of them are also the issues that are affecting us. And so within, within relationship building and relational organizing, I really, I really feel like my approach to organizing, one of the things that drew me to DSA to get more involved after Phil's campaign was that I, I felt aligned in the desire to really build community and have it be beyond like, Hey, can I get your petition signature? We're like doing this thing, but like, how are you? I'm at your door. <laughs> like, how is your day going? I realize I'm sort of interrupting your life, but like what, what about your life feels hard right now? Um, and then being able to find common ground. And it's about so much more than securing a, a vote or getting the petition signature, which is what we've been doing the last month. But it's, it's really about building community and building relationships. And, and those conversations at doors are what end up driving the policies that DSA push because it's based on the on trying to actively change the lived experience of the working people across the state and across the country. And that's what feels, feels really important. Yes, definitely. From, you know, from the masses to the masses, as the old mouse slogan goes, that is how we develop. We, how we exercise leadership, but also learn from and take guidance from the, the masses in motion that we are, you know, that we are hoping will make change. Um, so unless you have, if you have, unless you have any other remarks you want to make, Jen, I will move on to, uh, the candidate herself, Sarah Hanna here with us live and direct. Uh, and so we've, we've heard sort of what some of the origins were of this campaign. We've heard a little bit about what's going on in the, in the field operation and the conversations on the doors. So, I mean, I'll start, Sarahana, with the same question that I started for with Milo and Jen about your origin story, how you came to become a leader of DSA in the last few years. And uh, when this, and uh, did you imagine that then that was going to lead to you being a candidate for state assembly? Yeah, absolutely not. <laughs> I never thought that this was even an option, but I was also uh, mostly recruited by Milo to be, to be more active in our eco-socialism a working group and you know um to to take more of a leadership role and get more involved milo is also the person who got me involved in the public power coalition which is really the yeah, milo probably recruited almost everybody on this call to do something but um but yeah you know i think when i when i joined the chapter it was in a weird uh pandemic phase when you know i think you guys were just starting to do a lot of Zoom meetings, um, but when I really got involved in the Public Power Coalition, that made me realize um, how close we are to being able to affect really substantial changes that would impact a lot of people's lives because the scope of the state legislation is so perfect for, for things that DSA uh, local chapters want to achieve because it's just big enough to be a substantial and to you know feel sort of uh, universal in our lives, and it's just small enough to be very attainable. Very you know we 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 like we are running one of us for state legislature that that is being very close to um, you know being able to do what we want to do in terms of legislation, but also um, working on legislation also made me realize how much of it is a vehicle for, for building power, you know, because you cannot organize around anything without building power. Um, and Jen here is the person that I remember meeting for the first time when she came to Canvas um, for Phil in Kingston. Then I remember, Jen, the next step you took was you were on a Zoom call and you volunteered to take notes. And, you know, after that, it was just like, <laughs> more steps up and and then then you were a regular canvasser and then when you did this campaign you hopped on it right away and that is 
that is building power one person at a time, you know, and, and the pictures that Michelangelo showed earlier, like that is amazing that people feel the energy to come out and, and do something um, at a time when a lot of people just feel dread and just feel like, you know, nothing will ever change. Um, and that's one thing I feel very strongly about even when talking to people at the door is I do feel like organizing is taking all of people's um, fears and frustrations and turning them into action that is going to get steps closer to what we want. You know, at the end of the day, I think that that's what organizing is. And we, and then when we do that, there are some things that are just um, inherent parts of it, like building community, building friendships. You know, I was, when we were driving, Jen and I just canvassed in Woodstock tonight. And we, when we were driving to the parking lot where we were meeting up, um, Pete was driving me and I was just saying, isn't it amazing that we get to see these people all the time just because we're canvassing all the time? <laughs> like it's fun, you know? So I think like the social element and the community element is very important for building power in the productive way that we want to build power um, in the way that unifies us, um, in the way that makes us more um, effective. Also, so when we went to um, our turf, uh, we got out of the car and this woman was walking a dog and my first interaction on the street is, is she yells, are you the Democratic Socialist collecting signatures? And I was like, yes, because there's this person who lives on her street um, that was canvassed by a Dem committee person to, to sign for um, uh, our opponent, who's Kevin Cahill. And this person had basically said, I'm going to save my signature for the socialist in this space. Um, and he had written to me and then he had told all his neighbors, hey, hold off on your signatures. There's another person running that I'm going to tell you about. So he'd been holding these signatures for a while. So we went to this turf today, even though it was a turf that had been swept heavily by the Dem committee members, because it's, it's you know, this is the, that's the kind of support that we really want to uh, honor and, and build relationships off of. And we even went to doors that had already signed for Kevin and still had very meaningful conversations because the, the signature that they signed did not necessarily mean that they had decided one way or the other. And many of them even said, I think I broke the record today for less signatures um, and more positive IDs because there were lots of people who had signed for our opponent, but who still said, but I'm going to vote for you, you know, and, and that comes from these conversations that we have that are not tied around what can I get out of you? These are conversations that we're having for the, the, the sake of having these conversations, because that's what brings us closer. That's what, you know, uh, tells us what our possibilities are. So I want to say that the, the two main takeaways for me is that it is such a powerful tool to have access to in this age of divided attention to show up at somebody's door and have their undivided attention. And you can talk about whatever you want to talk about. You know, that's like, it's, it's incredible access. Um, and the other thing is a lot of people um, who have been curious about DSA have had the chance to hear, hear from us straight what it stands for, what we're trying to do. Um, and you know, a lot of people that, that we have now started asking to join our email list, we want, we want them to know more um, than just this race. You know, we want to know, we want them to know what's what we are in it um, for the for the long haul, because it's obviously not just this race. This race is just a vehicle to get what we ultimately want to get. And, and one of them is for people to stop being um, cynical and helpless and start really using their power because every individual does have that power to build a movement. And, and that's what this is really about. Excellent, Excellent. thank you. Um, so kind of go, jumping off of what you just said, I wonder if you would say a little more about like, you know, the fact that you are out here representing DSA and socialism in some way, and people may have, you know, different, you know, misconceptions about DSA, or may be scared by it, or they may just be confused by it, or not know anything about it. So I wonder, any any sort of thoughts you have or experience you had in sort of talking to people out there on, on the campaign trail uh, as a public socialist running for office? Yeah, many people are curious about that aspect. You know, one of the things that I was asked um, when I was meeting with a lot of the democratic uh, committees in the district because you know many community members are part of those communities. So I made it a point to meet with all of them and, and a lot, uh, you know, some of them 
asked me, so are you running openly as a socialist? And I was like, yes, yes, I'm running openly as a socialist because that's who I am. And I'm not going to hide something uh, just because uh, about who I am. I fundamentally am just because I'm running for office. The point is to foreground those things and not to hide them, you know. And there have also been other very progressive people who have sort of uh, never really understood what DSA um, was really about and have asked me, okay, so tell me, tell me more about DSA, you know, so there's been those types of people. And I really think that through the, the work that we are, are doing and, you know, part of the reason for having this um, program was also to think about how we can hi highlight more of the chapters uh, work through this race. And I think as we, now that the weather is getting better, I really hope that we can, you know, do more in-person things that brings the chapter and the campaign more explicitly together. And I think that, you know, I really see um, it happening that people are seeing DSA as like a, a really like a thing that they can be part of in this region because this district is very progressive. Like Peter, you were saying earlier, you know, where we run candidates. This is, this is the, exact example um, this district of where a very progressive uh, base of voters have been underrepresented by their legislators for so long um, and are just ready for yeah and are just ready for change and I think that's exactly the kind of people that we need to start mobilizing and tapping them into you know long long-term work and and um, the type of work that covers the spectrum for everything that we want to achieve. Yeah, and and on that note, then maybe we we can move on to sort of what what your vision is for you know Assembly Member Sarah Hanna, um, what you what you're looking forward to doing, not just in terms of the legislative, but in terms of you will you know when you're elected to the Assembly, you become you know the most prominent DSA member in the Mid Hudson Valley in certain ways, and so. There's, you know, and again, we've talked earlier about how this is not just about winning elections and it's not just about policy, though it is about that. It is also about organizing and building in a broader sense for socialism. So what is it you're excited about? What is it you're looking forward to? What is it you're aspiring to be as our, our DSA assembly member? Yeah, I think one thing for sure is, um, is just be the ability to be an organizer in office and, and what that looks like for people who are trying to um, bring change in their everyday lives, you know, because I think there are lots of people doing lots of things in this district um, that are not necessarily uplifted by our state legislators. But what we should be doing is we should be uplifting that kind of work and, and empowering people to do more um, at the local level. You know, for example, Phil is um, in the county legisla uh, legislature and there's only so many things you can do um, in the county legislature, but that kind of vision the county legislature is trying to push could really be, you know, um, empowered and, and emboldened even more by sort of a um, unity of vision between different levels of um, uh, offices that we have in our government. And the other thing is, you know, I also like Milo and Jen, despite being an introvert, love canvassing because it is so fun just to talk to people, see how they live, what they're thinking about. And like, I don't actually know. And, and Phil has already set an example of being one of those people who won an election and still showed up at the doors and people are like, what are you still doing here? But that is so great to be an elected and still go around talking to people and still be like part of that fabric of, you know, what, what we need to take um, to the legislature to, to really build the future that we want. So I, I really think, you know, that, that would be the most fun part of being an elected is to be the voice for uh, all of the other people who are trying to do um, so many great things. Um, because I do see the legislator as just, you know, one piece of that coalition that we need. And it is an important piece because it, as we can see, it can block a lot of the things that we try to do um, on the outside. Um, so I think it's that, I think it's being an organizer in office that is more of a, a, a collaborative partner than something, you know, that then uh, a person that you have to chase uh, for, for a very, very basic request <laughs> or to sign a very basic letter, you know? Um, yeah, so I think that's that's what I hope it would be. And, and yeah, Milo also mentioned this, but definitely uh, making space for more people to run 
because this the running against the establishment is so difficult. And even though we feel completely energized um, and exhausted at the same time, <laughs> one of the things that we absolutely want to do is make, um, uh, you know, a, a repeat use of everything that we learned um, and, and help other people run for office because it is absolutely so important for our democracy to be actually democratic because it is just taken for granted that the this like pecking order and like the closed door way is the correct and the 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 respectful way which you know it's not respectful actually it's it's pretty um bad for our democracy and why people don't trust anything cover, coming from politicians and the government yeah that's Absolutely. I mean, I, I can just from my experience, you know, being in Kingston, being on the doors, it's like so many people, they're only like vaguely aware that they have a state assembly member. Um, you know, so just that that presence, like you're talking about somebody being present and being present in a way that's not just for elections. You know, we talk about how that's organizationally important for DSA, that we are present on, you know, in the streets, not just for elections. And then that's going to be true for you as an elected official as well. Um, and then do you have anything closing you wanted to say, Sarah Hanna? Otherwise, I, I know we do we do have something that we need everybody to, to do uh, in the next in, in a few days. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to say that it feels really powerful to bring, you know, the, the, the potential and the energy of one person a piece at a time and, and build a movement. I think that is um, very empowering to also know that you are um, really needed somewhere. And this is something that you can do just with a little time um, out of your schedule. Um, so yeah, I think that that's what I would say is, you know, Sammy in our team always likes to say, instead of doom scrolling, you should um, organize. And I think that is very healthy and productive. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, don't want people too late, but we have a few minutes. If people have questions or comments you want to make, the, if you can just type something in the chat, I will be happy to just ask it. That's probably the easiest way. Um, but Milo, I know, wanted to say something, and I know we uh, have something that, uh, you know, we need to remind everyone about. So, uh, Milo, go ahead. Yes, I can speak to both. Um, so the only other thing I wanted to add to, like, after victory, what that looks like, um, I want to remind everyone that, you know, what we are doing with this campaign is also building the chapter infrastructure, a new, for lack of a better word, generation of leadership that can revitalize and keep building the Mid-Hudson Valley DSA into the next uh, few years. And one of the things I'm very excited about is the potential of having Sarah Hanna in the assembly and running a local public power campaign with all of the field experience that we have gained through this race. I can't really can't understate like the depth of skills that are being developed on a daily, weekly basis through this race for a oh, like tremendous number of people. Uh, it has created like so many new leaders for our chapter that it's just incredibly exciting to think of just how much capacity our chapter is going to gain and how much experience our chapter is gaining in real time because of this race. Um, and so I really look forward to what our future campaigns can look like, not just electoral, but issue-based campaigns as well, because we'll, we will have someone that has power and has a voice and like is a real leader in this region who can, like Sarah Hanna said, connect the dots to the local level and build that coalition for public power in a way that we do not have a representative here doing at all. Um, and so that that is very exciting. Um, should I speak to the, to the big announcement or Sarah Hanna, do you wanna take this one? I see you shaking your head. All right, I can do it. Go so, it. okay. So maximum hype. I know I keep saying hype. Hype is the word of, of this campaign for me. We have a tremendous call happening on Monday. It is a, our, we're calling it our ready to lead campaign call. It's going to be at 7 p.m. It's, being, it's virtual. It's going to be on Zoom. And the reason that this is an important call is we are going to basically be getting everyone caught up on exactly where we stand with this race. Uh, and we have made huge milestones. We have come such a tremendously long way. And that was evident in some of the pictures we looked at in the conversations we had here tonight. But there are numbers that will literally make your head explode uh, when you hear them. And we are not going to spoil anything on this call. We're just going to tease it. But people want to show up to this call because it is, it is tremendous what we have achieved. 
However, we are entering the next big phase of this campaign starting in April. Uh, we have been petitioning all throughout March. And so starting in April, we are really uh, entering a new phase of the campaign in persuasion and talking to voters uh, and, and kind of going into a slightly different strategy. And we want to really build out and get as many people to this call as possible so we can launch our April efforts with as much momentum as possible. And so um, in addition to, of course, asking everyone on this call tonight to sign up to uh, this Monday call, we are also asking if you can invite one friend, two friends, three friends to this call. I don't care if they're not political people, okay? If they have an issue, if they got a, a rate hike because of Central Hudson, if their health insurance bills are too high, if they can't afford their fucking rent, come to this call, okay? This is the call to come to because we we are not just connecting to people on the basis that it is important to get involved in this election, but it is why people have to get involved in this election, okay? It is fundamentally an opportunity to take power back from someone who is incredibly corrupt. And I say that because he is literally corrupt. We found out a few weeks ago that our opponent received over $3,000 from Central Hudson in direct donations, okay? And he is currently in the process of being tasked with like, overseeing hearings to like un make a determination if they're like corrupt it's, it's insane so everyone needs to come to this call on monday um so that we can really keep our momentum going and we can launch this next phase of the campaign with as much strength as possible um that only happens if people on this call come but also bring people who may not be yet involved in this race um it is an incredible race to be a part of and i i just want to really emphasize that the community that we are building through this race is powerful. And it is one you want to be a part of. Uh, it is an empowering campaign. It is a campaign that is extremely hands-on. You will learn, you will experience really powerful things at the door. This is a special district. It really is a special district. It, it bucks all the trends. Older people are like super progressive and like socialist at the door. It's wild, it's bizarre. And like every interaction I have at the door is memorable. It is a really special race and it's a really special district. And you don't want to miss out on, on being able to get involved in this race. It is, it is a really, really empowering campaign. Um, and I, I think people, you don't need a reason to get involved. Like <laughs> the reason is it's evident. So everyone should sign up and you should get more people to join with you. Um, Cause it's going to be a really amazing call on Monday. And then of course, um, if it hasn't already been dropped into the chat, um, there's a form that we're hoping people can sign up to at least one shift this week. Uh, we're knocking doors tomorrow, Saturday and Sunday in a whole bunch of towns. Um, and so there's plenty of, of shifts this week that you can get involved in and get a first stab if, you're, if it's your first time. It may not be your first time. You may have already canvassed for, for us or been on a million shifts, but you still got to sign up to a shift this week. Um, and so, yeah, it's, I mean, we're knocking doors for the first time in Gardner starting Friday. We're going to have a shift in Gardner again on Sunday. Um, so a whole new town, whole new group of voters to talk to. It's very exciting. Um, so definitely sign up for a canvassing shift if you haven't already and definitely sign up to join us on that Monday call as well. Great. Thanks so much uh, for that hype uh, ending. Everybody definitely make the call on Monday and definitely, uh, I think I will be probably out in Gardner this weekend. Um, the, so uh, I've, I haven't seen anybody in the chat. We, if this is your last call, if anybody has any questions, any comments, anything they want to throw at any of the members of the panel. Um, otherwise, you know, we're about a quarter after nine, we can wrap things up. Uh, last call. Otherwise, uh, I just want to yeah, thank you, Milo and Jen and Sarah Hanna for coming and helping us do what we try to do in this, uh, you know, in this chapter, in this organization is to bring bring together theory and practice, bring together strat strategy and tactics, bring together the abstract level with the actual practice of it on the ground. I mean, I'm kind of a theory and, you know, intellectual kind of dude but like none of that i'm also a marxist so i don't know that means anything without actual masses in motion making making their own history uh and so that's that that's what makes me hype about doing stuff like this and about seeing campaigns like this happen um so yeah uh thanks everyone for coming hopefully we'll see y'all around the way as the campaign and the chapter go forward on to victory solidarity Yep. Solidarity forever. Good night, everybody.